Good morning, church family, um, and sort of welcome to this, our purely online service. Now we're going to look today at a tale of two kings. And um, I felt a little bit last week that I was, I, was a, I was becoming a little bit of a bit of an English literature teacher. Uh, we were looking at the literary writing and, you know, some of the clever ways that Matthew wrote his gospel to point to certain things. And I feel like today um, I'm a different sort of a teacher. I, I've, I've taken off my English teacher hat and I've, I've put on my history hat. We're going to have a look at the characters of Herod and of Jesus. Now, to form my short biography of Herod here, um, I've used the ancient writings of Plutarch, Strabo, Suetonius and Cassiodeo, but um, also mainly the writings of uh, a historian called uh, Flavius Josephus, um, and he is well known as a Jewish scholar. Now, I got a lot of these suggestions uh, from a book called Herod the Great um, by uh, Dr. Glebe. And um, I've also taken, of course, the little bit that we find alongside the Gospels. But for us to know a little bit about Herod, we need to look outside of the Gospels into some writing that was happening by, by, non, by non-Christians, by non-Jews, um, and by Jews in the culture of the day. So what we can learn about Herod is that he was born about 72 years before Jesus. He was an Arab from the land of uh, Edom or the Edomites. Now Edom, not Eden, Edom, was where Jacob from the Old Testament's brother Esau settled back in the book of Genesis. Edom had been conquered, it had been ravaged by famine, uh, it had been war-torn in a very similar vein to that of the land of Judea that Herod had been given kingship over. Uh, And he'd been given kingship uh, over Judea by the Romans about 37 years before Jesus was born. And he'd converted to Judaism, possibly as a way of sort of appeasing those that he was leading. Now, Herod was from a family that were friendly with Rome, and hence he was entrusted with running this part of Rome. He was a famous military man in his youth, a skilled horse rider and archer. He was also a massive fan of infrastructure. He brought Judea into the modern Roman era with great construction. Reservoirs and aqueducts brought clean water to the era. Herod was famous for his reconstruction of the temple. And he was seen by many as great, but when he placed a large gold eagle at the entrance, the large gold eagle, of course, a symbol of Rome, he lost a lot of favor amongst the Pharisees and Sadducees. He built his own army and navy, and they fought in battles for Rome and were used to keep Herod safe, uh, protect him. He also used new technology quite well. A new form of hydraulic cement was used to build the harbour and port at Caesarea Maritima. Now this made the area a really important trade hub. He used new construction methods to build at least five forts where he and his family kept safe from uh, any insurrection. He also built whole cities for pagans in the area as well. He oversaw a peaceful time, generally, which many liked. Peace in terms of battles against others. For nearly 400 years, Judea, Jerusalem, um, Edom, the surrounding areas, they'd all been through a really rough, tough and bloody time. Alexander the Great, the Syrians, the Persians and of course the Romans waged war on the area. The Maccabean Wars that you may have heard uh, from a Jewish point of view, uh, well they took place during the time before Herod's reign. But Herod brought about a time of peace as he rebuilt this area. The Jewish people appreciated the relative peace 
of the era. Although Herod was not really seen as Jewish, he was too close to Rome for many. Uh, he wasn't to be trusted. He switched allegiances whenever it benefited him. He was also tyrannically violent. He was horrible, savage to those who didn't fall in line with him. He was a fearful man, much like many rulers of the day. He feared being assassinated and usurped. As he came towards the end of his life, he feared not being mourned when he passed away. He wanted to leave a legacy. In his old age, he became quite paranoid, staying only where it was safe. He was so concerned that he wouldn't be mourned, he came up with a plan and told his son, Archelaus, and his wife, Salome, to collect a group of well-known and respected people in society and have them killed on the day he dies to ensure that people mourn the day and that they remember him. Herod ruled with an iron rod. He was a, a man of the sword. The people feared Herod the Great. They kept in line because he was a little bit unhinged. They also feared what might come after him. And actually we find out that after Herod dies, the Romans take more control. They give less control to the family of Herod. They split the area into two. And the area becomes a whole lot more volatile after Herod dies. So there's a, a, a potted history of the story of Herod. And to get that, as I said, we need to look outside of biblical scripture into the history books to find this information. But it really does help when we then look back into scripture. So let's reread some of the verses from last week. Let's hear now, and some of what we've heard hopefully clicks as we read about him in scripture. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter two, verses one to 23. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Her King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then... What was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. 
Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that our Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. So we read there from, from Matthew 2, uh, verses 1 to 23 and in there we come across a Herod who is old and ill he fears losing his place in history his power and his legacy he hears talk of a successor and a successor not from his own family line but he hears of this baby born in Bethlehem this king built a very earthly old uh, earthly mold Herod he was a, a builder of great things, like the builders of the Tower of Babel from the Old Testament. Well, he fears, starts to fear, for what he will leave behind. He wants to be remembered. He wants to be missed. He wants to protect his family line as well. And the idea of someone coming in who is not his son concerns him. He knows that he isn't really Jewish. He knows that his crown and throne are not really the true crown and throne. But he's clinging on to power in this moment. He's done, he's done some good things. He's done some great things. Look at all the things he's built. That surely speaks of his greatness. And yeah, he had to do some, some bad things to get the good things through. But, you know, that's acceptable, is it not? That's what Herod thought. He's Herod the Great. He's brought the area up to speed. He's revolutionised the area. Trade and technology have now become quite important. The people, his people, surely owe him. He's Herod the Great. He's a doer. So he needs to do something to keep him, or at least his family on the throne. On the other side of the coin, we read about Jesus, a baby. And although it doesn't say it in Matthew, his throne is a manger in a small but famous village of Bethlehem. He's not hiding in a mighty fort surrounded by army and navy but with normal people in an everyday place. He's not at the end of his life, but he's at the start. He's not old, bitter and ill, but young and full of promise. Although he's only a baby, Matthew has told us so much about him in the first chapter. We have learnt so much about Jesus, or who Matthew was pointing Jesus to be. This little baby has come with a real backstory. And here, Jesus' early life, it was marked by nearly constant movement. He was born straight after a long journey to Bethlehem. And soon after, he had a long journey as an immigrant to Egypt. And then he returns another long journey back again. But this time to, to Nazareth, uh, about 150 miles from Jerusalem. Jesus didn't really call anywhere home in his early years, constantly moving, constantly under threat. Now, I know last week I mentioned allusions to the Old Testament Joseph narrative, but here we also see allusions to the Moses narrative as well. Herod is painted as a hard-hearted pharaoh type. 
the death of all the babies, um, which, of course, in a small village like Bethlehem may have been in single figures, but it's still a horrific scene. It's very similar to Pharaoh's much bigger plan to stem the growth of the Israelite children in Egypt, found in Exodus chapter 2. And the fact that in Exodus chapter 2, Pharaoh felt threatened by the Israelites looks very, very similar <laughs> to how Herod feels here. The plan for killing of the newborn baby children was as shocking an ask for Herod. And the fact that God gives the midwives uh, a, a reverence for him and the bravery not to partake in the killing back in Exodus, I think um, it's, it's really interesting. It's really similar to how God maybe uses Joseph, Mary and the Magi to bring about his will. In both stories, God puts people in places to, to, to stop some of this happening. And of course, there's a demand when, when Pharaoh is thwarted by God and the midwives back in Exodus, Pharaoh demands that all the young boys were thrown into the Nile. It's horrendous. And Moses' mum does place him in the Nile but places him in a basket to try and keep him safe and secure. And God steps in and moves Moses into a place of safety, the palace in Egypt. There are plenty of cross-references between these two narratives here. The Exodus and Joseph narratives in the Old Testament were known word for word by every Jewish child and adult. Um, they would have seen this and they would have seen how obvious some of these illusions were here. Herod is a Pharaoh figure. Jesus is a Moses figure. But what, what did Moses bring about? Why is it important to show Jesus as a Moses figure? Well, Moses of course brought about freedom from exile. At this point, as soon as you see that Jesus is being sort of like um, shown to be this Moses figure, you're sitting there saying, OK, right, well, Moses brought about freedom. What might Jesus bring us? And the people were really, really looking, as we discussed last week, at freedom. They wanted freedom. To your Jewish reader in the year naught, many, but, you know, not all, well, they hated the Romans. Many feared what might happen if Herod was usurped. After all, <laughs> even in the freedom story of Exodus, there was a rocky and unpleasant time ahead in the desert, 40 years of wandering. This story brings hopes of freedom, but a reminder that it might be a tough time to get there. Both of these stories tell of a tyrannical, power-hungry leader. But both of these stories tell of a promise that God keeps. And this might point to a, a bittersweet future. Nothing like the political stability maybe of the last 35 years. Was this moment the calm before the storm? Even if... The storm brings about freedom. And even when the freedom comes, what sort of freedom could they expect? When we read it now, we can so easily jump into what we know about Jesus, uh, who he is, what he does. We're reading the story knowing the outcome. But put your yourself, if you can, in the minds of those living out the moment as it happened, or someone reading the story for the first time, not knowing the outcome. There is a promise here, something to grab onto. The allusions to Joseph and Moses help the reader see some positives that are coming. It was obvious that God was working in those circumstances. We hope that the reader or person living uh, in this time got the hints that Matthew is convinced that Jesus is Lord. 
but it's tough living in and through uncertain times. For me, reading it here, it begs some questions. When you've got these, these different characters, we've got to ask ourselves, what sort of person are we going to be? Do we want to be faith-filled, like some of the good characters in this story? Joseph and the Magi. They seem to, they seem to obey without question what they, what they hear from God in dreams. Are we going to be faith-filled? Are we going to be hope-filled? Or are we going to be fear-filled? Like Pharaoh. And it even mentions the fact that much of Israel, all of Israel it says, I don't know if it means all, but all of Israel was concerned. There was a, an uncertainty here. Are we going to let ourselves become fear-filled? And um, what sort of a king are we looking for? That's another question it begs as well. What sort of a king are we looking for? Are we looking for a tyrannical builder looking to live forever through his legacy, his construction? A chief master politician who swaps sides whenever it suits, who changes allegiances when someone comes into power. Someone happy to kill babies, a number of babies, just to try and get to the one who threatened him. Or, for our king, are we looking to this small baby? born so humbly with a strange family history albeit a royal one could he be the saviour the messiah the promised one Yahweh God these two characters these two kings one very very earthly and one very, very different. Who are we going to follow? Let's pray. Lord God, who are we going to follow? Matthew is pointing to you, Jesus, the baby. so humbly brought into this world so quietly celebrated showing a different type of kingship and a different type of kingdom help us see today what we do with what we've read help us readjust our focus to see what's important to you. Help us not to get sucked too much into the worldliness and the worldly problems and worldly solutions. Help us have godly vision. We ask these things in your name. Amen.